Okay, uh, in the previous slides I showed you the, um, an overview basically of uh, what, uh, wh what you are going to, to learn through this course and mainly not really an overview because you didn't see so much about the methodologies uh, but uh, uh, more of the motivation why um, the thing that I will present to you in this course are, are relevant. Uh, I mentioned during the presentation that uh, we will have to deal um, with, uh, with several stakeholders and uh, uh, I mentioned different activities uh, in the software engineering uh, um, process that are development, testing, etc. Now let's see uh, which which ones are the roles that you will deal with in this uh, that you will deal with uh, with the different methods and the task in the software engineering process this this is just a very 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 broad overview okay which are the roles role in software engineering uh, are different they change based uh, on the process also that you may have in a company, they vary on the dimension of the company. I, I will not, uh, I, I will always repeat it until uh, you are tired that uh, every company is different, every context is different. But in general, uh, a software engineering company or a software company always have at least the developers that are the ones who do the coding. Of course, this could be also in principle outsourced because I may be a company that have some uh, that doesn't develop in house, but is just uh, combining the code developed by different developers outside. But in general, in some way, developers are always in, are always involved. Um, sometimes uh, you may have designers and architects. So uh, designers and architects. I'm I'm reading in the slide uh, from the bottom and like checking some roles uh, somewhat uh, randomly. Designers and architects are the ones that design the system at a high level, the ones who do the project, basically. Uh, very often, in small companies, these uh, are the same as developers, so, and, or they don't even exist. If you are, uh, if you are in a company where uh, you, are, uh, you don't design the software, but you uh, simply incrementally develop it, you, you don't have this, uh, this type of roles, okay? Uh, you have the requirements or business analysts. We will see the requirements engineer, business analyst, several names I use for that, functional analyst in some cases. And this is the ones that gather the requirements from customers and users and create uh, the requirements documents to be used uh, by the developers. But very often, this is just a guy that interacts with the customer and uh, doesn't write down the requirements document, but simply speak with to the developers to say what they should do, or write down the so-called user stories that are short form of requirements uh, if you are using so-called uh, agile processes, okay? Then you have the users, the one that will use the system, and the customers, the, buy the ones who buy the system. These are also in the scope of our interest. What is the difference between customers, uh, clients, uh, let's say, and users? Uh, normally, users are the actual users. For example, in the example that I made in the previous part of the lecture, in which I was considering a, hosp considering a hospital, uh, the user of the system to um, update information about the uh, coronavirus are actually the doctors, so the general practice doctors, the so-called medici di famiglia in Italian. These are the users of the system, but they don't, they don't pay for the system and they don't pay for the development of the system. The customer is actually the, uh, the, health, uh, the health organization, the health company, for example, the hospital, or if you are dealing with, uh, um, if you want to, to, to deliver this product to the whole set of hospital in Tuscany, for example, it will be the region. So you have different subjects that have different needs because the user probably in this case don't care about the, the price of the software while the customer does. And in some cases, the users are also customers. For example, in case of a mobile application or, of, or any consumer softwares, uh, for example, if you think Netflix software, uh, we're all users, but we pay for it. And we are also customers. So, but uh, have, you ever, have you ever met someone 
from uh, from Netflix uh, asking you what is uh, what is your need for build, building the system. It didn't happen. Uh, so you have a role, but you don't interact directly with them. But they can understand what you need by sampling from uh, uh, from uh, your interaction with the system. They try to understand when you are watching those movies. Uh, which type of movies are you watching? And they understand uh, what are your needs based on the usage of the system. And this is typical of many consumer products, uh, like, for example, Netflix or uh, any app that you have in your mobile or Microsoft Word or any of these uh, uh, type of consumer pro consumers products that uh, uh, that are used by. Um, that are used by by people uh, and that are oriented uh, to the large market and are not uh, uh, specific for solving a problem like the one i said for the hospital or for a chain of supermarkets for example if the company is large you may have also some managers in general you distinguish between three levels of management uh, in a large company you have top level managers which are responsible for controlling and overseeing the entire organization so this is a top level middle level which are responsible for executing organizational plans uh, according to the company policies and uh, they are basically intermediate towards the top management and low level manager that are have a direct contact uh, with the developers they say and uh, uh often they are called uh, pro project manager okay they have they are role models for the employees uh, they supervise and they control the timing and they do a more fine-tuned uh, control but they don't give let's say the the decision for uh, the decision for a more uh, mm, larger plan they are focused on a project or two projects and they direct a specific project but uh, there are more level of management abo above them and then there is the board of directors so it's a people of group elected by the stockholders uh, possibly if if, the, if it is a company uh, if it is a market company <clears throat> And they decide corporate policies and make management decisions. Normally, when we study, uh, when we study um, software engineering problems, uh, we don't deal much with the board of directors. Of course, we may deal with managers because the low-level managers, especially the project managers, uh, are uh, are dealing with the software and they are really relevant roles uh, we deal with customers with users with requirements business analysts sometimes with designers and architects although many companies don't have them and uh, with developers and testers so testers are the ones who test the code so the subjects that may be also uh, or subjects who review the code this is uh, the review the code they simply don't test but just look at the code uh, and uh, and check for the quality this may be often uh, the developer themselves so everything may be adapted to a specific uh, company's need but uh, these are the uh, main roles main, main names that you will uh, that you will hear and you will read about uh, in software engineering publications uh, as I said, companies may include only a subset of the roles. Some of the roles may be covered by the same person. So, uh, as I said, some testers may be actually developers, or some code reviewers may be actually developers, or the designers may be the developers. And in some cases, even the business analysts may be the developers. And the role may depend on the adopt uh, software process. So uh, there, I didn't go through this uh, this aspect, but uh, uh, there are two, let's say, general uh, general paradigm of software process. One is the traditional software process uh, that is uh, so-called waterfall process, and uh, in which you have uh, the sequence of steps like the one that i described so you start from the requirements uh, you start with the interaction with the customer you write the requirements uh, you uh, design the software you write down the code you test it uh, and etc uh, etc et or uh, you have the uh, so-called agile software process 
uh, and that, that is the more modern way of uh, uh, programming of uh, developing software that uh, consists in having uh, uh, frequent interactions uh, and uh, uh, frequent de delivery of uh, prototypes and rapid implementation so the um, you don't wait to develop you don't wait uh, for the entire requirements document to be completed or the design to be completed before coding but you start prototyping since the beginning since the beginning and you have a frequent stand up meeting with the other partners and you have uh, uh, more relevance of interaction between uh, between uh, people <clears throat> so roles may depend on the way that you decide to develop your software which are the main tasks? The main tasks uh, you saw them in the in the previous uh, in the previous uh, in the initial slides, but I want to emphasize them in here because uh, uh, the examples that I will give throughout the the whole uh, the whole class they will deal with these aspects. So when I speak about requirement solicitation and analysis, I speak about the first phase in which you try to understand what is needed to be built. Okay, so requirement solicitation and analysis is a very vast area and uh, may have uh, different uh, uh, practical, uh, practical solution in the sense that, uh, as I told before, you may have a situation in which you interact directly with the customer, so with the people who will pay you for your product, or you may build uh, a consumer product and so you have to harvest, uh, gather the requirements uh, from uh, from the mass, from the people, or just rely on new ideas uh, internal and then test these ideas that are internal to your company and then test this idea uh, with the people. Of course, they didn't ask people for the iPad or they didn't ask people for when they invented the car. So many new invention also in software, they come from ideas and observation of reality and don't need to uh, require a direct interaction uh, at least at the beginning with the user but uh, it has been demonstrated that the involvement of the users since the beginning uh, may be really useful to test your idea and understand that you are not wasting your money in the in the investment that you're doing software architecture Software. So this is the requirement solicitation and analysis. Analysis means, uh, uh, means several things, means uh, try to structure the requirements. Imagine, for example, the requirements for a system uh, that is built uh, on the, the trains that you are using, you may be using, not now, but usually, uh, the, the, the system that uh, breaks the train in case uh, the driver exceeds with the control speed. The requirements for these are like 300 or 400 pages long. And uh, this is just uh, one part or the more technical requirement. And you have different volumes that uh, uh, specify how this software, uh, the different parts related to the risk, uh, to the, to the other aspect, let's say, of the process. But <clears throat> it's like a very large volume. And uh, analyzing these requirements means that uh, first you've gone through the process of uh, uh, starting from more abstract requirements, let's say, and then you have formalized them, and then you have checked that there is no ambiguity in these documents, that they have been that they are clearly understood by anyone who reads them, etc. Okay, so uh, the analysis process, especially for um, very complex systems uh, is um, and very safety critical system like the trains or aircraft is very is very long. This uh, this phase in which you try to understand and formalize in written form uh, your requirements. Uh, then you have the software architecture. Software architecture was uh, what I uh, what I was speaking also before about uh, that is uh, designing the software so creating the uh, the picture of your software in uml before you implement it uml is the most uh, common way uh, of uh, of designing your software software architecture of course uh, there, there is a distinction between software architecture and design because architecture 
is, uh, is more high level while design is more related to object oriented design, let's say. So it's more detailed why the architecture should be language independent normally, so it doesn't rely on objects and this type of stuff. But uh, for what we are interested here, software architecture is uh, uh, building somehow a model of uh, uh, what will be the structure of the software that satisfies uh, uh, the requirements that I have listed. Software development is the actual act of developing. That is not simply opening the computer and start writing the code. It's also interacting with the other developers, interacting with the software architects, interacting with the requirements solicitation, uh, with the requirements analyst. So interacting with several other uh, subjects and writing down what the software should do, but also the bug in the software because of course uh, when you write the software you it doesn't it doesn't always work uh, properly but also refactor the software so i may need uh, to uh, i find a bug that affects a certain point of part of the software i need to refactor it or i need to refactor the software because uh, new requirements come from the customer can have several cases of course then you have software testing. Software testing also, in this case, you may have different levels of testing. For example, you have only a function, like for example, you have only uh, to do unit testing for a Java program. So you test just that unit according to a set of um, tests, or you may need to do integration testing. Integration testing means that, for example, for the system that I was exemplifying before, for stopping the train in case the there is a the, the driver exceeds uh, the, the the maximum speed uh, in that case uh, i may need first of all uh, one uh, system that is on board but the system has to be linked uh, also to the brake uh, so i need to integrate uh, probably the software that is directly controlling the brake with the software that is in this other box uh, and uh, and this uh, is uh, monitoring the speed of the train and in addition in this architecture i might also have uh, some uh, uh, software that is deployed uh, deployed on the ground that is sending uh, for example the status of the signal so the semaphores that you that you meet uh, uh, across the line so i have to integrate i have to check that all these elements interact properly and this is so-called integration testing, not, not this real same thing of the, of the unit testing in which I test a function, but still I'm doing a testing activity. And uh, uh, this is of interest for, uh, for, uh, for software engineering and for our scope then. Then there is software documentation. It's something that is uh, normally poorly done, but in some cases uh, is mandatory. So it is, uh, for example, when you are developing safety critical systems, uh, you have to document each step of your, uh, of your process and you have to carefully document your software. So, so writing down the, the, what the software is doing and uh, if, you, if, you are, if you are developing also uh, manuals, for example, for users or manuals for uh, developers also how the, the, the software should be used and how it should be extended and maintained. And then you have software maintenance. Software maintenance is the other phase in which, okay, I, I need uh, to update uh, the software based on new requirements. Normally the software developers are involved in here, but the activity is completely different because I have to refactor. Normally the software do small changes, debug, etc. And finally, there is the software process management. As I showed in the beginning of the presentation, there is a process. This process needs to be managed by some, by, some, by some people. I've shown three levels of management, and these three levels are involved in checking that the whole process runs smoothly. But software process management is also dealing with the, uh, concurrent version in systems, uh, dealing with uh, uh, bugs, uh, bug report, dealing with all the, um, all the tools and, echo and, and system that allows me to better manage uh, my software. So to summarize, in software engineering, we are dealing with uh, all the roles that I listed 
in this previous slide, in all, with all these roles from uh, managers to customers to users to requirements analysts to designers to developers and testers and more you i will show you more details on the role uh, when we will speak about surveys which are more focused on people so you need to understand uh, more uh, in detail what are the roles and uh, these are the tasks so these people and these tasks. So we will deal with elicitation, architecture, development, testing, documentation, maintenance, and software process management. You don't need to learn uh, in depth what are all these phases. What I told you now should be sufficient uh, to have a, a sufficient understanding because here we are focused on tasks and people, but mostly on methodological aspects. So let's pass to this uh, uh, other part and uh, this will be uh, the the last uh, the last part for uh, for today that is related to uh, one of the core uh, one of the core element uh, of uh, of research that is uh, formulating research questions so basically anything that uh, uh, that you do in research in software engineering but also in any type of research starts with a question about the reality okay a question about the world this is normally in software engineering a problem to solve so the question about the world is how can i solve this problem but it can be also curiosity about some observed fact this curiosity is often uh, related to something that you that you feel is relevant but you you cannot say why for you is relevant and um, for example it is interesting to know why do developers prefer to work at night isn't it it's something interesting but uh, why is it interesting why uh, you are asking this question you really don't know but probably uh, if uh, uh, if you understand why for example by interviewing set of developers you may understand that uh, this will help you in uh, in better in better uh, plan your software process in better define uh, for example your schedule for for your company because if you find that developers prefer to work at night so why should you force them to work during the day why should you have a strict uh, strict timing or if you discover that this is not true and some people prefer to work at night some people prefer to work during the day why don't you profit from that for that uh, from that and you start having some people working during the day and some people working during the night so you have 24 hours people working and uh, uh, it can be also some curiosity about some unknown fact so some unknown fact this is a, a curiosity about something that you may have observed so you have an intuition and you are curious to know but also you want to know something that you don't know sufficiently you want to explore so like, for example what are the most frequent effects in open source code which are the most typical uh, the defect that you can find uh, in open source code this can be a vague curiosity you don't know why it's interesting but you may be interested in that the research question is the inquiry that guides your research so it's a question written in natural language when i say natural language i say it means english italian any language that you normally use a spoken language or written form in this case and uh, the research question uh, can be something like which are the most frequent effects in code developed by people with less than six months of experience so by novices this is a research question also which are the most frequent effects in the code developed by people from six months to three years experience so this is another research question the research question is something that it's written is clear and guides your research and you should always refer to it uh, to design your research you normally structure your research and reporting according to one or more research question uh, writing them down can help you to clarify your goal and also uh, not just to you but also to the reader because uh, you do research but you have to communicate it of course because uh, anytime uh, uh, anytime you you research you, you research for something uh, if you don't communicate it is useless okay it's just useful probably for you for your knowledge but uh, 
uh, is not useful for the other researchers or the other software engineers. <clears throat> Normally, if you have more than one research question, it is good to establish a general research question or research objective. So, uh, for example, if I want to consider how aspects or how things are in practice, so more uh, curiosity about observed facts, uh, I can ask myself to which extent certain defect types are related to the degree of experience of the developer. This is a general research question. And the other two questions that you saw at the beginning of the slide, so which are the most frequent defects in code uh, by, um, developed by people with less than six months experience, and the other question about uh, defects uh, the, in code developed by people that are older, this can be summarized to, with a more general research question. It's quite intuitive, like to which extent certain defects type are related to the degree of experience of the developer. I want to understand the relation between degree of experience and uh, uh, defect type because uh, my idea is that novice people tend to introduce uh, more uh, of a certain kind of defect while older people tend to do mistakes that are more let's say at architectural level uh, but i can also uh, introduce a more general question also related to this like that consider also why aspects for example which is the relationship between the defects types and degree of experience of the developer. So <clears throat> this is more vague, okay? It's not uh, just that I'm searching for relationship between the facts type and degree of experience. I'm also un trying to understand uh, uh, what type of, uh, of relationship is there in a broad sense. So why, for example, people that uh, have less experience do certain type of defects? And in this case, probably I need to go further and not just uh, do an experiment, for example, in which I have uh, young people, old people, and uh, let them program and uh, see the defects that they make. I need also to interview them and to ask them why they committed a certain defect and uh, to check with them uh, for some motivation that uh, can uh, make me better understand the relationship between defect type and degree of experience of the developer okay this is a uh, um, something quite uh, difficult to grasp but uh, uh, i invite you to to reason about that because the difference uh, between and uh, between how things works and why things uh, uh, works in a certain way is is very relevant and uh, you need always uh, always you need to resort to uh, different type of methods if you want to understand both how aspects so how things are related with a sort of correlation let's say correlation function and why aspects so find the human reason behind certain phenomena so many times a clear formulation of this general research question comes after the formulation of the most specific research question. So it is easier to write down uh, which are the most frequent effects in code developed by people that has less than six months experience because it's more practical, you know? You know that you have to select people with less than some months experience. But then you have to think, what is the thing that I want to understand? I want to understand relationship between age and uh, type of defects. And uh, I want to understand also why there is, uh, if there is a relationship, this relationship holds. In some cases, to distinguish, uh, you can, uh, between uh, like detailed research question, like the ones that I listed before, and the more general research question, you can sometimes formulate the general research question as a research objective. So instead of a question, just a sentence, like the objective is understanding to which extent a certain defect types are related uh, to the degree of experience of a developer. So this is uh, what is my research objective. How do I uh, pack it into, partition it into different questions? Yes, I start with the first question, so which are the most frequent defects for people with six months experience, then most frequent defects with people with uh, between six and three, uh, six months and three years, and then I can add the other other question for people who have uh, um, who have uh, more uh, 
uh, who have more experience and finally answering the general question that will tell me which are uh, which is actually the the, the relationship between uh, the the type of defect and the use of experience here uh, i will uh, i will tell you how to uh, to write down i will give you a guide that is taken from robert felt you can check this uh, pdf in in, in internet that is uh, uh, is uh, free that is very simplified guide to how to formulate uh, research questions it is very important it is not important really to um, let's say to uh, to remember this graph this structure but it's important to uh, refer to possible example actually of research questions but of course didactically like for for teaching you um, for teaching you the different types of research question is very useful to have this classification okay so we have uh, first of all research question uh, uh, in software engineering have two type as i told you at the beginning first we need to understand the reality and then we build a solution so my research question can be knowledge focused so understanding the reality or solution focused so the objective is transforming the reality okay let's start with the knowledge focused knowledge focus can be exploratory so i don't know much about the phenomenon under studies I want to create some tentative series. I want to try out some hypotheses. And uh, I want to <clears throat> give evidence, for example, that a certain phenomenon uh, that I want to study can be me measured. For example, uh, the Kuzius question should be general. It's exploratory. It's a new thing that uh, I don't know anything about. For example, to which extent do developers get tired of coding? I still don't know if they get tired of coding, okay? And uh, uh, I still don't know why they may get tired of coding. So this to which extent is a, is a simple way of saying, hey, explore this theme, explore this topic, okay? Then I have a base rate question, base rate question, and uh, when you already know something about a certain phenomenon uh, we want to understand how the phenomenon under study appears which are the normal patterns uh, and this can be asked when you already know a little bit so you know that people are able uh, that people tend to uh, get tired of coding my more detailed question is about uh, frequency when do developers get tired of coding okay so i ask uh, i ask myself uh, uh, something um, about uh, uh, the, related to the base rate that can be frequency or can be process. We'll see more more example uh, later on. Other uh, so this in the first case in exploratory case I don't know anything. Now I know that a certain phenomenon happen and can be measured. So I asking a base rate question in a different stage of the research. And then uh, I can also ask a more detailed question, like for example, how certain phenomenon <clears throat> and the study relates to other phenomena. So why do developers get tired of coding? I ask myself. So which are the caus causes? As you see, there is already causality there. Uh, which are the causes of, uh, for people to uh, get tired of coding, okay? These are different levels that, uh, uh, for knowledge focus question, that are normally reached uh, uh, when you have different degrees uh, of knowledge over a certain theme. Then you have uh, solution focus questions, and uh, uh, basically they describe better ways to solve a problem or a certain situation. So, which strategies help to achieve uh, a certain a certain goal? How can we refine uh, a certain tool to uh, achieve a certain goal in a better way? So they are related with creating a new solution or refining an existing solution. These are still research questions, as I told you before, because uh, uh, I need to find a way, I need to create an hypothesis for a solution, and I have to test the hypothesis against the reality. Like in the example before, I have to check that my proposal uh, of uh, forbidding the people to work at night actually 
reduces the number of bugs in my code and doesn't create new new problems. Okay. So here you have uh, uh, the different subtypes. I leave you. I leave you uh, this uh, this uh, from uh, from the from the work of Robert Felt that uh, that is linked in the slide and uh, <clears throat> are related to exploratory questions can be of three types like existing descriptive and comparative so existence is does this phenomenon exist so as i told before uh, that's the mm, do people get tired of coding or not uh, is this uh, thing that software engineers really do like for example is uh, um, documentation something that they really do because in, in a survey i may have uh, in an interview i may have uh, understood that uh, these people are really really um, annoyed by the the fact of uh, uh, writing down documentation and they say that is one of the most time consuming activity of their work but uh, uh, do they really document the software and uh, this is often not the case. So uh, asking this uh, this type of existence question is important uh, also for uh, understanding uh, which one is the is the reality. Okay, if a certain phenomenon actually exists, it deserves to be studied. Uh, descriptive descriptive cases are uh, more related to properties and attributes and things that I can measure of a certain phenomenon, like what are the properties, attributes uh, of a certain uh, phenomenon. For example, <coughs> <coughs> uh, when uh, uh, it is, uh, is it, uh, is it, uh, is it free, not frequent, but for example, how long is the documentation that they produce, for example? And uh, in any case, uh, the things that are related to, not to the existence, but to the, the script, general high level description of a certain phenomenon. And comparative, like how can a certain phenomenon differ from another phenomenon? Then you have the base rate, as I told, uh, there are can be related to frequency of uh, or to the process. So how often or how does this phenomenon normally uh, normally occur? Uh, <clears throat> then you have the relationship that are again uh, very similar to the exploratory. They are uh, explo similar to exploratory, but instead of focusing on a single element, they relate to multiple elements. For example. Do occurrences of X correlate with a certain other phenomenon? Or uh, what are the reasons for a certain phenomenon? Do I know that a certain phenomenon cause, causes another, cause or prevent another phenomenon? And uh, <clears throat> more uh, related to actual causes, uh, so causality related question can be comparative of uh, uh, context related. And here you have. Uh, Couple, a couple of examples. So this is just a list of uh, typical example of question and can guide you in better formulating the research question. This is quite important for you because it will be part also uh, of the exam to be able to formulate uh, uh, research questions, okay? So uh, please pay attention to, to this, uh, consider this material, try to formulate research questions and try to uh, give your own example and uh, understand uh, what is the, their classification. As I said, uh, classification is useful to, to give you a way of, uh, of making sense of the different types of question. But in the end, uh, it is uh, useful to look at examples. Okay, this uh, list of examples, uh, uh, if you replace the X and the Y with uh, some phenomena of interest for software engineers, uh, they they can be really useful for you. How to create research question? You create research questions by starting from not a well defined uh, research objective, because as I said before, it usually come afterwards, but with the topic normally. So it can be software development speed, and then you can ask yourself: Do you want to create more a better understanding or? You want to solve something related to development speed. If you want to create better understanding, then you are dealing with a knowledge-based question. 
uh, and you want to ask yourself something like what affects development speed how can we measure development speed so how can we measure how fast are the people in developing code if uh, then i have to ask myself okay i've understood that uh, i have a knowledge based question i have to understand how much is known about this specific topic if not much is known i have to ask an exploratory question so how can we measure for example development speed because this is also a problem for example how can we measure the in relation to what in, rela in relation to delivered software delivered good software for example uh, which are the measures that i can put into place okay then you can have uh, more information so you know also the, the phenomenon of uh, development speed but you don't know when certain uh, certain when or how it occurs so uh, what is the development speed actually of agile teams so specific types uh, uh, specific types of teams uh, and uh, i want to measure the um, i want to measure uh, in the specific case uh, uh, what is uh, what is their uh, development speed uh, in the case in which you know the phenomenon and you have understood it quite correctly uh, how things work in practice so you can measure and you can know also how uh, things uh, are working so you've been able to measure for example the development speed of agile team you may want to understand what is affecting development speed so why certain teams are faster than others so in this case you want to understand the relationship before between certain unknown causes and the development speed in case instead you're uh, working towards a solution based uh, um, question the question can be how can i improve development speed what is the easiest way to improve development speed you see that there is a relation somehow. First, as I said before, knowledge. So first you understand what affects development speed. And then you ask yourself, how can I improve it? How can I move the factors so that development speed increase? What is the easiest way to improve development speed? So which factors can I use to uh, somehow tune it? So for example, pair programming, I can use another language or I don't know. I can make people work uh, at night, work uh, the time that they want. Uh, I can remove the presence uh, of a program manager. I don't know. After I've studied the factor, I can put in place a solution that solves my problem. Uh, normally, as I said uh, before, uh, one research question is not sufficient. And you normally need multiple questions. So uh, try to find, after you have written down some base question, try to find the main research question or overarching research objective, and then keep on refining the, your type of question, okay? And check the types of question in the previous table and uh, adapt them to your problem. So, so you start with the question and you refine it, you refine it, okay? Uh, you, you refine it, you, you first go up, to a more uh, higher level research objective and then go back and refine again so to understand whether you've covered your actual research objective and just in the end very often just at the end of your research you finalize the research question this is something that they they seem to come at the beginning they should come at the beginning at the beginning you write some research question but it is true that every time you do an experiment, every time you do a case study, every time you study a real phenomenon, you understand that your question needs to be changed. So your research objective and your research question will become stable just at the end, just like the requirements. Like the requirements for a system, they become stable just when the system is finished. Also the research question, they get transformed and transformed still even in their form, intermediate form, they are needed to guide your process. So um, this is uh, uh, this is all for for today, and uh, we will uh, we will meet uh, again on uh, on Thursday.